Okay, so let me start by thanking the organizers for putting together this nice conference and for giving me the opportunity to speak. I want to talk about work, mainly work in progress, um, that I've been doing over the last uh, few months or so with uh, Rajesh Kopakuma, uh, Wei Li and Chang Pan, and also uh, a paper that appeared earlier this year uh, with Shuvik Data, Wei Li and Chang Pan. And I should say right from the start that much of what I'm going to describe is uh, motivated, largely motivated by work of uh, Tomasz Prochatska, and I'll, I'll refer to it as I go along uh, during the talk. So let, let me remind you about the sort of general setting I'm interested in. Um, at a tensionless point in moduli space, string theory and ADS is dual to a nearly free conformal field theory that just follows from the usual translation between the parameters. And the conserved currents of the free CFT correspond to the massless higher spin fields on ADS. And the idea is that in the tensionless string theory contains uh, a, a sector of uh, massless higher spin fields that uh, account precisely for a Vesilyev like a spectrum, I having one, one massless higher spin field for each spin. So this is an old idea, and, uh, and uh, more recently this has been, there's, I mean among others, there's one concrete realization of this idea in the context of ADS3, namely the, uh, as, as you all know, the uh, CFT dual of uh, string theory in ADS3 cross S3 cross T4 is the symmetric orbifold of T4, and the symmetric orbifold of T4 is, uh, uh, contains in particular a, a, a large uh, W infinity algebra. This W infinity of, uh, of, of n, n equals to 4 algebra. And this is uh, the W algebra that appears in a family of dualities between these higher between the Zilliev higher spin theories and uh, uh, conformal field theories. So in some sense, that's the CFT dual of the embedding of a higher spin subsector into string theory at this very special point in moduli space that is dual to the uh, uh, symmetric orbifold point on T4. So, so this is a, 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 a concrete uh, realization. And uh, what, uh, what we are trying to understand is that this is uh, really like the the analog of the free point of, uh, say, uh, super young mills in, in, in four dimensions. This is the lower dimensional analog of it. And in that case, it has proven very useful to think about this theory in terms of a spin chain uh, where the integrability of the system becomes manifest. And what we would like to understand is what's the analog of this uh, spin chain like integrable description in the context of ADS3 CFT2. In particular, one, one thing one may want to understand is what's the relation between the Youngian symmetry, that's uh, one of the hallmarks of integrability, to the higher spin symmetry that's manifestly present in the dual CFT. So we want to understand how does the sort of integrable spin chain part of the world and the higher spin CFT duality part of the world uh, fit together. Now one possible lead about where this Youngian symmetry may come from uh, is that the actual string theory in ADS3 has an even bigger symmetry than just this W infinity algebra. And this is uh, what uh, Rajesh and I uh, coined the higher spin square. So this is, a, this is a, uh, a, a, an algebra where you have a, a W infinity algebra, but the actual symmetry currents of the symmetric orbifold do not just contain this W infinity algebra, but it also contains infinitely many representations of this uh, W infinity algebra. And you should think of this as being the level zero part of a Youngian, and then this is the level one part, and then uh, recursively by taking commutators of D, you generate the full Youngian type symmetry. So that's one possible lead where you may hope to find a Youngian symmetry in this context. Now in the following, I shall not actually discuss the n equals to four superconformal situation that where we really understand the embedding into string theory, but I'll rather concentrate on the simpler bosonic duality involving a, uh, the, the, the original bosonic a higher spin CFT duality. And the reason for that is that it's uh, technically much simpler. Eventually we hope to be able to generalize what we've been understanding about this context to the supersymmetric setting, but we haven't quite reached that far. So in that case, the higher spin symmetry is this uh, W infinity of lambda algebra, which you can think of as the, as the minimal models W and K in the limit where, where, where the lambda parameter is n over n plus K, and the central charge of this W infinity algebra is the standard minimal model central charge. And the classical description in which you can match it to a higher spin description is the limit in which you take n and K large with the ratio n over n plus K being equal to lambda kept fixed. Now, what will be slightly important uh, later on in this talk 
is that this W algebra is not actually parameterized directly in terms of lambda, but if you look at the structure of this algebra, what you realize is uh, if you construct its low-lying uh, commutation relations, then it's uniquely characterized by the operator product expansion coefficient involving the spin 3, spin 3 going to spin 4 field as well as the central charge. And as a consequence it's not directly parameterized by lambda but it's parameterized by the value of this OPE coefficient and if you decode how this OPE coefficient depends on lambda and C what you learn is that there are actually three different algebras for a given value of the central charge that are isomorphic because they lead to exactly the same uh, coupling constant for the spin 3, spin 3, spin 4 field. So this will be important later on. Now the other thing I should say is that in order to describe this uh, Youngian symmetry that uh, seems to be uh, very closely related to this W infinity algebra more easily it's convenient to add in a U1 generator. So we shall look at the algebra W1 plus infinity of lambda which is uh, W infinity of lambda plus U1 and this is really without much loss of generality because whenever you have a U1 field you can always cos it away. So every algebra that contains a U1 field plus a rest is isomorphic to a free U1 plus the rest. So in particular this algebra will also depend on this parameter lambda which is inherited from the lambda dependence of this uh, W infinity algebra. Okay, so, so the paper I was alluding to at the beginning, the paper by Tomasz Prochatska uh, that appeared at the end of last year, in December of uh, 2015, he noted or observed or used previous results of uh, other people to note that this W infinity, W1 plus infinity of lambda algebra is actually contained in a specific Youngian algebra, namely the affine Youngian of GL1. Now in the following what I want to explain to you is how this embedding works on the additional further tests we have performed relative to what he has done and it will also become clear that this is actually a very powerful technique towards describing the representations of the W infinity algebra because the representations of the W infinity algebras will be labeled by plane partitions so there's a neat way of uh, understanding say the characters of these representations uh, geometrically. So, so the, the F and Youngian, so these Youngian algebras tend to have different types of ways of being characterized. The version with which we've been working is the one in which the, it's, you think of it as an associative algebra that's generated by the generators Ej, Fj and Psij, where J runs from 0, 1 up to infinity. And then you have to give a long list of commutation and anti-commutation relations. And the algebra is simply the associative algebra generated by this generate modular all of the relations I'm about to write down. Now I'm, I'm going to give you the relations uh, piece by piece. Uh, eventually I will have written down all of them but uh, I don't want to write them down in one go because that will be somewhat overwhelming. So th the first thing you should think about or you should note is that the Psi J's you should think of as being zero mode so they're the Cartan generators of this Youngian algebra because their commutator is equal to zero. And then the, the Ej mode and the Fk mode you should think of but this is uh, not to be understood totally strictly as being the plus and minus one mode of a spin j plus one or spin k plus one field. I mean this is to be taken with a grain of salt as we shall see later on. This is not uh, strictly true but roughly speaking uh, these generators are the plus one modes of the spin fields of spin j plus one and k plus one. And that makes sense because the plus the commutator of a plus one mode with a minus one mode gives you a zero mode. So uh, this uh, relation is uh, sort of uh, uh, makes some sense. Now the, the, the generators Psi 0 and Psi 1 are central. I, they commute not only with the other Psi's but they commute with uh, simply everybody. So they, are, they, are, they, they commute with the Ej's and they commute with the Fk's. So Psi, one and psi, uh, psi 0 and Psi 1 are central and the way you should think about them is Psi 0 is the central term of the U1 and Psi 1 is the zero mode of the U1. So the, because the zero mode commutes with everybody in each representation you can choose the zero mode to take any specific value and that will be to be thought of as the eigenvalue Psi 1. Now the, the higher generators Psi 2 uh, with respect to Psi 2 all of these Ej's and Fk's are uh, eigenmodes. The adjoint action is just the plus 2 or minus 2 and that basically means that you can think of Psi 2 as L0 and then this is or a 2L0 and then this is just the usual commutation relation with a plus 1 and a minus 1 mode. Now the eigenvalues of the other Psi J generators 
are determined recursively in terms of relations of this type. So, this is one of the defining relations of the affine Youngian, namely this combination of commutators together with this anti commutator here uh, is equal to 0, and you can use this recursively to uh, determine the eigenvalues of the psi generators on the E's. So, this is the relation for the E's, and there's a similar relation for the F's that I haven't written out. Now, if you look at this uh, relation, there are, there are parameters sigma 2 and sigma 3 appearing. So, these are three parameters that characterize the affine Youngian. So, there's not just one affine Youngian, but there is a two parameter family of affine Youngians characterized by the value of sigma 2 and sigma 3. And for the following, it will be convenient to parameterize these sigma parameters, not, uh, don't use them directly, but think of them as being expre expressed in terms of uh, three parameters h1, h2, h3 that add up to zero such that sigma 2 is the all the bilinear products and sigma 3 is the cubic product. So, sigma 3 is h1, h2, h3, sigma 2 is h1, h2, h1, h3 plus h2, h3. So, this is how we are going to parameterize the, the parameters that appear in the defining relations of the affine Youngian. <coughs> now, as I said, there are, there are additional relations that uh, characterize the affine Youngian. So, the additional relations are a relation involving two E's that are somewhat similar to the relation between Psi and E. So, this is now a relation involving two E's and uh, it's of the same sort of uh, type. And then there's a similar relation for the F's. And finally, there are two sir like relations giving the uh, repeated commutators of, of, uh, of three E's uh, where you symmetrize over J1, J2 and J3. But note that you shift J3 plus 1 here, so this is non-trivial. This gives you sir relations and these you have to set to zero. And again, there's a similar relation for the F case. So, this is the, the affine Youngian of, uh, of affine GL1. There's a, there's a way of uh, describing it more more conceptually, but that's a sort of a hands-on way of making sense of this, of this Youngian algebra. Now, what Prochatzka argued was that this, uh, there is a relation between the conformal field theory or the coset or the W infinity algebra, which I may parameterize in terms of N and K, and this uh, affine Youngian. And the, the relation is most easily expressed in terms of these H parameters. Remember, H1, H2, H3 add up to zero. As you can check, they do. And they, the sigma 2 is the, the pairwise product and sigma 3 is the triple product. So, Prohatska claimed that the, the relation between the, uh, the W infinity algebra at n and k uh, and the parameters of the affine Youngian are given by this relation, where, as I also mentioned before, the psi 0 is to be identified with the central term of the U1, i minus n, and psi 1 is the eigenvalue of the U1 zero mode. So, this will decouple once I've decoupled. Uh, the u1 from the w infinity because the, the u1 will just go, go along for, for the right. So, what we've done is we have checked this identification by uh, constructing. Uh, so, we've checked this identification by constructing the low lying generators of w1 plus infinity in terms of uh, affine Youngian generators. So, what we've done is we've written down the, the modes of the, of the W infinity generator. So, this is the spin 1 field. This is the uh, uh, familiar Vera Zorro generator. And this is, uh, tries to be the one mode of the spin 3 field. So, remember I said earlier you shouldn't think of this directly as the plus 1 mode of the, of the spin uh, uh, 2 plus 1 field. But there are correction terms and these are required in order to make sure that these generators sit in the correct SL2 representation generated by L1, L minus 1 and L0. Now, so, so this is more or less uh, imposed upon you as the correct, uh, as the correct 1 and minus 1 mode. But then what you notice is that these generators do not come from local fields. And this is probably part of the general structure that a Youngian is a somewhat a non-local uh, construction. So, what happens is if you try to calculate the commutators of these, they do not fall into the form that is predicted by the general conformal symmetry. But what you can do is you can adjust it by adding in uh, correction terms. So, the correction terms you add in are look a little bit funny. They are not of the any sort of a typical local form but they have to repair the non-locality of these uh, affine Youngian generators. But once you do that, you get generators that then satisfy the standard commutation relation of your W infinity algebra. 
So we've done this for the spin 3 field and we've done it for the spin 4 field. So these are somewhat lengthy computations because you have to work out what, uh, what improvement term or correction term you need in order to make these non-local expressions uh, local. And then once you've done that you can calculate the operator product coefficient of the spin 3, spin 3 going to spin 4. And what we find is that this is uh, the version of this, uh, of this uh, parameter n4 over n3 squared. That's how it's expressed in terms of the parameters of the affine Youngian. And then you compare this with, with respect, to, with, uh, you compare this to the known formula that is, uh, holds for W infinity of lambda. And what you find is if you set H1, H2, H3 in the way Prohatska proposed, and you set Psi1 is equal to minus n, and you plug in all of these values, these two formally precisely agree. So this, uh, I mean, so Prohatska had guessed this relation just by comparing the central charge. And what we've uh, been able to see is that it really follows directly from the structure of the algebra, namely by com computing the one uh, coefficient that really characterizes the algebra and seeing its dependence on these parameters. Now, I should say that if you think about doing this recursively, what this tells you is that the, the W1 plus infinity generators uh, are basically equal to these EJ generators modulo lower spin correction terms. And therefore, if you recursively do this, what this tells you is that, the, uh, that not just W1 plus infinity sits inside the affine Youngian, but the universal enveloping algebra of W1 plus infinity sits inside the Youngian. And in fact, there's a one-to-one -one way of uh, rewriting every affine Youngian terms in terms of an element of the universal enveloping algebra. So this really demonstrates somewhat more pedestrianly that uh, the affine Youngian is indeed uh, the, the universal enveloping algebra of W1 plus infinity. I should also say we've checked uh, uh, other, other parts. We've checked uh, there is a, a free fermion realization of the theory at lambda equal to zero. There's a free boson realization of the theory at lambda equals to one, except the free boson doesn't give you the spin one piece. It only gives you the W infinity algebra. And correspondingly, in that case, you only, uh, you can only, you only need these generators of the F1 Youngian to describe the uh, free boson type generating bit. But uh, what's quite neat is that when you, when you do this, so remember sigma 3 is expressed in terms of n and k in that way and lambda is n over n plus k. So if you sit at lambda equal to 0 you take k to infinity and if you sit at lambda equal to 1 you take n to infinity. In either case you take sigma 3 to 0 because it goes like inverse uh, square root of n times k. But while sigma 3 is 0, sigma 3 psi 0 goes to 1 in the lambda equals to 1 case because uh, this is just this expression. So when you take n to infinity this goes to 1. And what this means is that in this funny anti-commutator that I showed before, this term that you would naively think to drop out at sigma 3 equal to 0 contributes for the j equal to 0 term because this combination is equal to 1. And if you include this, then it matches perfectly. But you really need to, to, to take uh, care of this subtlety, but then the free boson description sits perfectly inside this W, uh, in, inside this F and Youngian. Now the other thing that's quite neat is that uh, this triality symmetry I mentioned earlier. So I said that the algebra isn't really char uniquely characterized by n and k, but there are different versions that lead to isomorphic algebra. So you may ask what's the, what's the incarnation of this symmetry on the level of the affine Youngian. And uh, so the, the transformations of the triality symmetry are generated by these two transformations. And when you translate the first one into, into the action on these H parameters, what you see is that simply exchanges the role of H1 and H2, but doesn't do anything to H3. And as a consequence, it leaves sigma 2 and sigma 3 invariant because these are just all the uh, uh, bilinear or trilinear combinations of the H's. Now the second transformation is a little bit more subtle because if you just do it on the nose, you get something, some garbage which isn't equal to any of the H's. But you also notice that Psi 0 got rescaled in the process. And there's something I didn't tell you before. There's a, a scaling symmetry inside the affine Youngian. If you had been counting parameters, you would be a little bit worried that I had so many parameters. You can rescale the Psi's, the E's, and the F's. And in the process, rescale the, the alphas in that manner. So if I rescale Psi 0 to bring it back into the form of minus n, what this does is that it means that the second transformation just leads to the exchange of H2 and H3. So, so what this means again is that the F and Youngian parameters are unmodified, but this is quite nice because the triality symmetry acts like the permutation group on the three uh, labels H1, H2, H3. One generator is the permutation of H1, H2. The other generator is the permutation of H2, H3. Now I should also, as a side comment, say that this is a, there is another 
uh, description of these uh, young ends or uh, algebras that are believed to be very closely related, the so-called SHC algebra, and they look a little bit like the higher spin square, and uh, that, uh, that fits also th together with our pic picture, but in view of time, I shall uh, skip that comment. Now, the other thing I wanted to explain to you is that that leads to a very neat way of uh, describing the representations of this W infinity or W1 plus infinity algebra. And the idea is that the maximal degenerate representation of the affine Youngian and hence of this W1 plus infinity algebra are described by plane partitions. So plane partitions are boxes that you stack in the corner of a room in such a way they don't fall down in any of the possible directions. And the idea is that the different representations are labeled by the different asymptotics in the three directions uh, of, 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 of your room. Whereas the different states in a given representation correspond to the different uh, box configurations. So you fix the asymptotics and then you draw all the plane partitions that are compatible with uh, this asymptotics and then each such uh, configuration corresponds to one state of your corresponding representation and the L0 eigenvalue, the power of Q is just the number of boxes. And you can see very nicely that that's a representation of the F and Young and because the E generator basically adds a box, the F generator subtracts a box and the Psi generator acts diagonally. So obviously for the trivial asymptotic that just gives you the famous McMahon function that just describes the, the usual box stackings in the corner of a room and as, uh, as uh, we, uh, people have known for a long time that's equal to the vacuum character of the W1 plus infinity algebra so that just tells you that the trivial asymptotics just gives you the, uh, the vacuum character of this algebra. <coughs> Now the non-trivial representations are labeled by their asymptotic behavior. So for example, here's a generic case where along the z-axis you have this asymptotic behavior, along the y-axis this, along the x-axis this. And then there is a configuration with a minimal number of boxes that describes the ground state of this representation. And then you simply count how many boxes can I add to this configuration. So here the, the brown boxes are the descendants that I've added. So this is two, four, six, that this is an order a level seven descendant. And the character of this representation is simply the number of box configuration with seven additional boxes relative to the minimal configuration. So this gives you a, a neat way of describing these representations. And what this really tells you is that the F and Youngian has a, has a nice action where all of, these, uh, all of these zero modes are diagonal, unlike the usual W infinity algebra where the action of the zero modes is very complicated. So the, in particular the eigenvalues on the ground states can be, can be written down in this form and uh, what you observe is that they really depend on H1, H2, H3 in the way that you count the position of the, you sum over, you take the product over all the boxes, you take the X component, the Y component and the Z component of the corresponding box you multiply it by H1, H2, H3, and that's the, that's the uh, coefficient that appears inside this function. And what this tells you in particular is that the triality symmetry just permutes the asymptotic, uh, the asymptotic behaviors because uh, the triality symmetry exchanges, uh, permutes H1, H2, H3, but H1 describes the x-axis, H2 the y-axis, H3 the z-axis, and therefore the triality symmetry will just permute the different asymptotic regions into one another. So this makes very nicely sense of this old triality observation uh, of, uh, of the paper I wrote with Rogers a few years ago in that uh, the coset representation, the standard representation of this WNK algebra are labeled by those uh, asymptotic regions where the Z component say has trivial asymptotic and but then using this triality symmetry you are led to conclude that there is a third representation that has a non-trivial asymptotic and this is indeed uh, comes out exactly right uh, with the correct character, the correct eigenvalue for all the charges, etc. So it, it, it brings this, this, all this uh, family of these representations of this W infinity algebra nicely together. So in particular this is a, provides a powerful technique of the calculation of this coset or W infinity characters. In principle you can calculate using branching functions but that's not a super easy calculation to do. But uh, in terms of these uh, plane partitions, you can just have fun drawing boxes and counting how many possibilities you have. So it, it tells you very directly what sort of what the low-lying representations are. And recently we used this in this paper I was referring to before in order to identify the representations that correspond to the twisted sector. And uh, so these are representations of this kind and one could really guess what that they had to be of that kind because that gives you the correct character when you count uh, boxes. So let me summarize, given the fact that I'm out of time. 
So what we've uh, shown, and uh, as I keep reiterating, this goes back to an observation of Prohatska, is that the affine Youngian of GL1 captures this W1 plus infinity symmetry. In fact, it seems to be isomorphic to the universal enveloping algebra of the W1 plus infinity symmetry. The trility symmetry that's a little bit obscure from the point of W infinity has a very neat uh, action on the, on the representations in terms of exchanging the asymptotic direction. And among other things, this is a powerful method for the calculation of characters. And obviously what we would like to do is we would now like to take this F1 Youngian and try to understand the spin chain and compare it to the spin chain proposals for what people have proposed the spin chain description of uh, the ADS3 situation to be. But uh, the first uh, step we probably have to do in order to really make contact with uh, the work of, uh, of these people is that we have to make it supersymmetric, probably n equals to 2 and then n equals to 4 supersymmetric. And then the hope will be that we will be able to make, make contact with the, with the spin chain description of uh, string theory in ADS3 cross S3. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions? Well, I mean, so, so to answer the second question first, about which I'm more confident, is that this WNK algebra, so at the end of the day, they only depend on the parameter characterizing the 3, 3, 4 coupling constant. And that's some expression in terms of N and K. And the fact whether N and K are integers or not is uh, pretty irrelevant. What happens if N is an integer is that the algebra actually truncates and it contains an ideal. And if you divide out by it, it just becomes a WN algebra. But this algebra makes sense for any value of n and k, and they needn't be integer in order, at least for the algebra to make sense. Whether the representation theory is unitary, etc., is a different matter, but on the level of making sense of the algebra, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's not a problem. Now, regarding your refinement, uh, I, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Do you mean adding in some additional quantum number, or do you mean, do you think of q deforming it further to get q vera zero rather than vera zero? Ah, okay. Yeah. So, so, so that you can do, and that will probably correspond to some U1. I mean, you can you can add into your trace some additional zero mode, and that will that will pick up things like that. Yeah. But I mean, here it's quite nice that you're not deciding to split up the plane partition in a in a set of Young diagrams because that's uh, not compatible with this triality symmetry where you really exchange all three directions. Is there a uh, physical generalization where you have n copies of the fine Youngian? Is there any way to generalize this? Actually, you have n copies of the Youngian. The reason for my question is that you have n copies of the fine Youngian, you get this W algebra that appears in the HD correspondence. Well, I mean, actually, I mean, e even this algebra. I mean, so, so as, as I was uh, trying to allude to, but I was very quick on that slide, is that uh, there is this uh, uh, SHC algebra. And the SHC algebra has appeared in uh, in attempt to prove the AGT correspondence. And what you can show is that the SHC algebra is uh, isomorphic, or that embeds into the universal enveloping algebra of certain WN algebras. And for that, you, this SHC algebra seems to be isomorphic to this affine Youngian. And I don't think you need additional copies of the young, affine Youngian for this to work. So the the parameter n is somehow hidden in here. It's not that you need n copies in order for I that to work. The molecule the protocols, they show that they have n copies of the affine Youngian. That's not related to the SUN. So that's, that's the basis of the question. Yeah. That may be so, but I think uh, if I understand correctly, the Vassaro and Schiffman and Vassaro have shown that also the SHC algebra, which by all accounts I believe to be isomorphic to the F1 Youngian, is also isomorphic to, w, to the universal enveloping algebra of WNK. So you have to choose the parameters of the SHC algebra correctly. So you don't need to enlarge this description to see WN. You may enlarge it, but you can already see it on this level. But maybe you can discuss in private. Well, 
Okay, I think we should stop now. So we have a break and we resume at 4 o'clock. Let's thank our speakers again.